Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to start off by sort of setting the scene about why uh, why we want to have uh, a data and what's the value of a of a data pipeline, and the reason why we may want to have a data pipeline is uh, if you've ever been asked a question um, that can only be answered through data, like who are who are our best customers, uh, who um, what's our best selling product. Um, and also where's that report, then um, the answer is you need, to, uh, you need to have data from lots of different sources and you need to be able to um, bring uh, that data together in a way that, uh, that people can make sense of it. So the sorts of things that we're going to do with the data, uh, we, we want to be able to make decisions and sometimes that's quite um, instinctive. Uh, we, we want to see some sort of visualization or dashboard that helps us track some certain indicators. Other times we want a more detailed uh, report, or we may want to uh, feed data into a machine learning algorithm that is going to um, help us with uh, prediction uh, or some uh, understanding of the characteristics uh, of our, our customers or, or, or their behavior. But the, the key sorts of questions that we need to ask uh, about data is, well, when we're going to make uh, a decision, what are, what are the sorts of data that's going to help to support that decision, help, help us make that uh, decision? Where is the data now? Because it may be in lots of different places. And typically any organization has um, information in their accounting system, in their CRM, in their um, uh, on their on their website and, and analytics uh, uh, available there, but then what form does the data need to be in? Uh, and it's probably not its current form. So we need to be able to transform uh, that data. Then other characteristics like uh, what is the the volume and the and the velocity uh, of this data and the veracity because uh, we may, we're not always dealing with high quality data. Sometimes it's um, it can be quite dirty because um, some of the information may be old, may not have been updated, uh, or it may just, um, the data types may not match very well. So in the modern data uh, infrastructure, we've got a number of different components. The, we, we have a, quite a diversity of, of data sources and so we, we want to be able to pick and choose the, the data that's going to help us um, do, do business better. We need to use data ingestion tools. We need to ingest that data into um, a something like a, a data lake or a data warehouse, or, or it may simply be a, a structured database for us to be able to analyze and work with, uh, with the data. We need to be able to model that data um, and uh, given the complexity of bringing all that data together, we may uh, want to look for some sort of a workflow tool that's going to help us um, orchestrate uh, how we gather all that data and, and transform it. So um, a cloud data warehouse um, is, is sort of different from a, from a lake in that the, the warehouse is typically a little bit more structured. A lake is um, where we we realize well maybe the data engineers who are collecting the data are not the best people to transform it and uh, and massage it and you're better off just um, grabbing data as soon as you can and putting it uh, into into a lake where people who have more domain specific knowledge can. Uh, can figure out how to make uh, how to make more sense of, of that. Um, so, our components that lead into the data warehouse uh, they, they may come from operational systems like a CRM system or an accounting system. They may come from um, a, an API. They they may come uh, th that is a, a third party service that uh, we we subscribe to um, to. Um, bring in market data uh, or, or or something, and uh, and it may come in the form of flat files. Sorry, I'm in your way. Um, 
within the within the data warehouse, we want the data itself, but we also want some understanding of its, its structure and its characteristics. And that's really what uh, what metadata is. And we will probably need to summarize that data because very often when we're making decisions, we're not making decisions on individual transactions where we're wanting to aggregate things and see patterns uh, in the data. So we, and we don't need to see um, personally identifiable information in order to, uh, to do that. It's much better to, uh, to have summary data. So we could be doing some analytics on it. Uh, we, it may be for reporting uh, and it may be for um, uh, mining or machine learning uh, algorithms. So our data sources, they come in lots of different, uh, different kinds. If we're dealing with a database, it may be in a SQL format. If it comes from an API, we're probably gonna receive it in a JSON format. Uh, in a flat file, it might be in a CSV uh, or uh, an Excel um, format, or it may be um, we may be ingesting data from another um, data warehouse or data lake. So we, our, our concerns are who, who owns the, the source uh, of this data because we need to be able to negotiate with them for access uh, to it. Uh, what sort of volumes are we dealing with? And are we going to be able to, um, to handle that volume with our, with our systems? Um, how clean is it? And do we need to do any cleaning um, or validating of the data before we can, can use it? And, um, and also, do we really have the, the bandwidth to be able to um, absorb and ingest uh, this much data fast enough? So for, for ingesting data, we have some choices. We can build it ourselves um, using um, uh, starting with uh, with Python uh, or or another programming language, or we can um, use one of the uh, the tools that are available, whether they're open source uh, or, um, or or commercial. When when we choose to use a source, um, sorry, a, a tool to do that, well, the commercial tools cost some money, but they can save us a lot of time in um, in in. Uh, in figuring out how to connect to uh, to these sources because they, they often have connectors uh, to them. So there's a trade-off there. Uh, if we have to end up having to um, build a connector ourselves anyway, uh, because it's a non-typical uh, non uh, source or not one of the common ones, then um, then we, we may um, not bother with a commercial tool and, and uh, decide to, to, to build the whole thing ourselves. Uh, we may need to transform uh, the data a little bit, uh, even before we get to um, uh, to the ETL. So a, work, uh, um, a workflow orchestration platform uh, helps us to manage our pipeline. Um, and this is a simplistic diagram, but if you, you can imagine as soon as you get um, a dozen or so different sources and they have to have different things, um, uh, the data has to have different things done to it, um, uh, transformed along its path uh, and for different users, then this can be um, quite complex to keep track of. So a, a workflow uh, orchestration platform uh, is what's known as uh, acyclic. Um, it, it works from left to right because the, uh, once an action is taken on, on the data, you um, it, it makes things uh, complicated if you if you send it back uh, to a previous task because you may end up having having a loop an endless loop in the uh, in this workflow and you can't afford to do that. Uh, there are different tools to do that. Some of them are um, like Apache Airflow is open source, whereas there are also uh, paid uh, services. So. The most common patterns uh, we, we have for data pipelines are either the um, ETL or the ELT. The ETL has been around for a little longer. Um, we, we extract what, um, data from the data source, we transform it into the form that is needed by the downstream uh, users, and then we, we load it into uh, a data lake or, or data warehouse. Um, but 
the reason why the um, ELT pattern has uh, become, become popular is often the data engineer uh, who is very skilled at working with the tools doesn't necessarily have um, the knowledge to um, move, transform data into a form that the specialist um, a data analyst needs it. And they work with um, at, at a different uh, at a different level. So there's there's one aspect of uh, speed in getting data into a, a data a data lake um, can make the um, ELT pattern more attractive. And the other aspect is the division of responsibilities between the data engineer and uh, and the data analyst. Um, there's a sort of a sub pattern known as the ETLT, um, which is where there may need to be some um, minor transformation or clean, cleaning of data, be, um, but largely is following the ELT pattern. Uh, in a machine learning uh, pipeline, you've got added complications that very often we're using um, uh, different versions of the same data. Uh, and transformed in different ways. And uh, we may have um, want to retrain our, our models. So um, the data scientists are really concerned with uh, the versioning of the data, wanting to know exactly uh, the data's uh, provenance. We have to go through some pre-processing, um, maybe to tokenize it, to remove personally identifiable information. Um, and then the training of, of the model and, and the deployment. And this can go back in, in a cycle, which is why the version um, uh, is important. Um, I'm going to discuss just a couple of um, uh, methods of the, the data ingestion. And this is particularly um, relevant for uh, ingesting data from a SQL database. So you can, uh, use the, the SQL um, command set to, to ingest data from a, a SQL database. It has um, the advantage that it's quite simple um, if you're already familiar with, uh, with SQL. Um, it has also has some disadvantages though, which is why sometimes uh, we may want to go to a, a lower level using the binary log um, uh, replication. So in um, when we're copying uh, when we're ingesting data from the SQL database, we're, um, we're essentially using a select statement uh, to grab data from, from a database table. And this has uh, advantages because of its simplicity, but unless you're uh, ingesting the, the, the entire table or database again and replacing what you have uh, already, then um, it's... Uh, it's a longer way, it's a more time consuming way uh, of ingesting the data. And uh, a, a, a faster way is to simply um, ingest the data that has changed uh, incrementally. And for that, you need to have a good uh, timestamp uh, on when, when you last uh, retrieved uh, data from, from that data source. If you don't have a, an accurate um, timestamp, uh, or the, the, the synchronization between um, your your source and your um, your destination um, may may not be quite uh, in sync the, the the timings then then this may not turn out to be uh, very accurate. So the the alternative is to use um, a change data capture method to um, to grab. Uh, uh, incremental data from uh, from logs. The challenge is that every SQL implementation has a slightly different way uh, of doing that. So you need to be um, have a good understanding of that the way that particular um, uh, database does its um, uh, manages its, its uh, binary logs. And of course, if you want to really go um, as, as fast as you can, then you, you want to look at a, um, a, real, um, a streaming type or event-driven uh, type of uh, method of, of ingesting um, this data and, and moving it. And this can also be more flexible because it's not just about um, 
uh, ingesting uh, SQL data. Uh, it can be uh, other types of data as well. Um, if you're grabbing data from uh, from a data API, then you're probably going to receive it in a, a JSON format. Um, it's um, the the rest the rest API uh, is very uh, very easy to understand and and very easy to implement. Um, and probably eighty percent of of APIs you see around are going to be the, of the REST style, but um, for real time um, time sensitive type of applications, then the REST um, style doesn't necessarily work uh, especially well because it's uh, it's a polling type of uh, request response type of um, of interface, and if you're constantly polling for changes, then you're tying up uh, your uh, the network with all your requests you, and you're consuming the time of both the requester and uh, and the publisher of, of the data. So a, a, a publish subscribe uh, type of pattern may may work better for, for that. Okay, so I just wanted to summarize this um, uh, this discussion about data pipelines just to bring it back to what is the when, when you're thinking about how you construct a, a data pipeline, you, you really have to think about what is the need uh, that you want to uh, address and how time sensitive is it? What are the, what are the volume of data that you're, you're dealing with um, in order to uh, select uh, the, the best uh, type of, uh, of pattern? Um, with that, I'm going to uh, you know, finish up and I'll, I'll let uh, Kevin take over. While, while Kevin's setting up, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, sorry, let me. Most of the places we are, most of the places we are talking about JSON and CSS file formats, when we talk about storing the data, while the transformation phase, maybe multiple steps, but uh, I feel the parquet is uh, much better to store and faster, right? It, it consumes less. Sorry, sorry which, which type? Parquet. Um, parquet. File format. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I'm wondering why you have not mentioned about that. Um, OK. Um, well, that's good feedback, actually. Um, the um, I, I guess when we. Um, when we extract data, often um, say if it's in a flat file or if it's in an API, then we receive it in a, a format that's sort of at least semi-human readable. Um, whereas if you want to store it more efficiently, then um, you're going to store it in a format that's not not as readily um, uh, accessible by a human. And the but what what you're talking about is when you still need to have a way of um, uh, feeding that into whatever downstream system is going to be able to uh, consume that. So um, I, I guess it depends on the tools that you're going to be using um to um to read that that data if it can handle that that format. Um, 